fellow walked into the doctor's, he said, nobody will talk to you. The doctor said, next. <laughs> fellow walked into a psychiatrist. He said, my brother thinks he's an orange. He said, where is he? He said, in my pocket here. <laughs> fellow walked into an optician. So there was this fellow. He's, he's been talked about so many times. If he sued every, every comic that said, so there was this fella, he would make a thousand million in royalties. Well, well this fella, this fella is the ordinary working day man. He wants to laugh at uh, funny situations. It's like a world of fantasy. He doesn't want to hear about wars in Vietnam and, uh, and bombs and hippies and all this. This way out comedy. He, uh, he's the working man, you see, this fella. It's nice to see you sitting there, listening to something which is not. So there was this fella. <laughs> Amen. I am partially dressed in black in memory of all the comedians whose jokes have died here. <laughs> well done, Bernard. Oh, I, I knew the fellow turned in. I'm going to send him for X-ray, see if there's any work left in him. Lazy bastard. Well, this is the Embassy Club, and uh, I, I'm, the, I'm the proprietor of the Embassy Club. You know. Wonderful club, this. But there's thousands of clubs up north, you know, thousands of clubs. There's working men's clubs, you know, uh, where you can get a good cheap drink. Hardly any cabaret, but a good cheap drink. And they play dominoes and cards, you know, like a pub vault. And there's conservative clubs, labour clubs. Liberal clubs? Not many liberal clubs, because there's not many liberals, is it? You know. Well, you, when you book most uh, comedians through agencies, you know, and you don't know what you're getting half the time, you know. You can get some right stumers, you know, some right stone jugs. One fellow walked in here one, one night, you never seen nothing like it in your life. The rags was lashing to death, you know, like a tramp. I thought, so he must have come dressed for his act, you know. And he says, uh, I'm such a body and I'm four pounds. I said, well, I'm Bernard Manning and I'm sick before you go on. I said, what's your best gag? And he told me his best gag, you know. Like, you fell out of your cradle laughing at this. So I bunged him four quid and I said, get on your way. No good stopping in here, you know. You can't keep him on, because he'd know he'd laugh, you know, they've heard it all. You see, your audiences in clubs are very, very, uh, very critical. You know, this, up, up north, they've seen it all, you know. And it is the way you tell them, it's the way you tell the gag. You can tell a gag that can be offensive, you know. Uh, you could tell an Irish gag and uh, cause offence by the way you tell it. Uh, if you started on about the Pope, or uh, nuns, or priests, or Ian Paisley, or something like that, you know. Uh, if you really went too strong, you could cause trouble. But you've just got to do it in a funny way, like... Uh, Somebody threw a petrol bomb at Ian Paisley and, and he sucked it. <laughs> <laughs> now, we in Ireland have fought for 400 years for our independence and we got it, you know, in the Irish Republic. We got it, we got independence and what happened as soon as we got it, we all come to live in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, it's worrying. I mean, this IRA thing is worrying. I mean, it is worrying, isn't it? I said, geez, they're very short of funds. And, um... <laughs> No, but this fellow that's coming on now, he's got a very Irish name. In actual fact, he's more Irish than Irish. He really is, you know. He's as Irish as they come because his father was a priest and his mother was a nun. Let's bring on stage! <laughs> it's sacrilege that, you heathen bastards. <laughs> Let's bring on stage now the one and only Liverpool Irish man, Mr. Tom O'Connor, yes! <laughs> Bless you, Mag, isn't he nice, Mag? He's great. He used to be on the docks, he's working now. Uh, you've, heard, you've heard this advert on the telly, haven't you? A million dockers every day. Open a crate of fruit and say, Yeah, Jimmy, get that in your pocket. Lad, you know? <laughs> Most of the boys in the schoolyard right now, fathers either work on the docks or very near to the docks, and, and this is handy for me because I get all my humour from them, or a good percentage of it anyway. But my father's on the docks as well. He, he's in this big dock behind us here, the Gladstone dock. He's a key foreman there. Um, he's quite humorous, very biting. <laughs> he, was, he was great big grand, he was also. He was on the docks, you know, you probably know because he used to call him the wingless chicken. You know the wingless chicken. He puts his hands in his pockets like that and he says, we'll put them over there, and them over there, 
leave them where they are. <laughs> Mackie and the others still say, man, you know, but it, Well, I, you know, the, the Dockers, there's, there's about 10,000 Dockers, or perhaps a few more, um, in Liverpool, and, and they, they seem to enjoy having the mickey taken out of them. I think they, they take a great pride in, in being slammed. I mean, uh, they love stories about the fellow coming out of the gate with a coat full of alarm clocks, and as he's going past the bobby, one of them went off, you know, and he, he says, answer that phone, Jim, will you? You know, this sort of thing, I, I think it's a great pride they've got in it. Um, you can tell by their names. The destroyer, always looking for a sub. The home secretary, always going home. I mean, these are genuine men. I mean, I once had a chat with a union delegate from the docks and he said he had a hell of a job one day going down looking for the wingless chicken, strong arm Charlie and the destroyer. You know, these are the only names they knew them by. No, well, you see, I, I don't normally do this. You know, I, I no, don't normally skit at the dockers because as we know, like, things are slack and fellas are taking stuff back and... Uh... Have you ever watched the docker drinking at Christmas? He's brilliant. Well, have you ever watched the docker drink? You can't see the movement, it's just like that. But... <laughs> drinking at Christmas in the pub, 16 pints of bitter on a tray. Two in each arm, two under each arm, and two on either side, and he's there. Well, as long as the kids are enjoying themselves, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, boys, now this evening, the school choir and the group are doing a charity show at uh, Star of the Sea Club in Bootle. OK, so we're going to run through just a couple of the numbers that the boys will be doing this evening, all right? We'll start with Liverpool Home. I was born in Liverpool, down by the docks. My religion was Catholic, occupation at Knox. At stealing from lorries, I was adept. And under an overcoat, six of us slept. In a I lived about three streets up from here as a child. I went to this school. And, uh, I, I, this area suits me. There's plenty of work here, and I know my audience. Is. I, I don't usually work out of a radius of about 20 miles of Liverpool, so when I go home from school, I get my books marked, have a bit of a, a nod, out to the club, back about 11, so it works quite well, really. talk with our hands. I watched two fellas in a pub, truly, talking with their hands for 25 minutes and they never said a word. <laughs> One fellow said, um, I'm like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know really, I'm dying, you know what I mean? It, I... His mate said, I know what you mean, I've had the, uh... <laughs> after, after 25 minutes, the little fella said, uh, what are you um, talking about? He said, I'm like that. <laughs> I've got these two girls, I don't know which one to marry. The little fella said, what religion are you? He said, I'm a Protestant. He said, no, I'm a Catholic. No, I can help you here. Go on to our church, kneel down, the Lord will guide you. He went into church, he was only in five seconds, he'd run out. He said, the Lord's done it. I knelt down and there it was, right across the altar. Ave Maria. But it's the way we talk, isn't it? It is. It's the, no, it's the way we talk. I never tell blue jokes because I don't think there's a need for it, really. Um, Fellas, even an all-male audience in Liverpool will take humour, provided it's good and it's clean. And I think they think more of it, actually. I mean, they, they, they appear to go out thinking, well, look how intelligent we are. We haven't after a, a blue gag all day, you know. Sexy gags and all that. You know, fellas love to hear that about sexy gags. You're bound to get a laugh, aren't you? But uh, there's some rough clubs, you know. Some of the comics, oh, well... There was a, there was a club years ago... Uh, no names, no pack drill, but... The, uh, they got closed down, you know. One comic got fined £900. Pound. There was about half a dozen comics in it. Aye. And uh, got done for obscenities, you know. The police was in, taking, taking it all down, what they said, what they hadn't said. Ooh, you know. Strippers going too far, you know. Instead of just 
standing still and taking their uh, clothes off, you know, they was uh, flanging about the audience and, you know, the old bit to us. No, they won't wear it. It's against the rule, you know. No. Don't know whether they're coming or going. Hey? Yes, you used to have to walk on the plank, didn't they? I can't walk. And one day we had that big bird and we lost the plank. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It's kinky Marlene. She was kinky, wasn't she? Drop on the knee. Just finished a summer season swimming up and down Loch Ness. Do you remember yeah. that? <laughs> what a kinky bird. <laughs> Mind you, I, I don't think it would be the real thing, but that's a matter of opinion. But. Mm. Do you remember the night we all got knocked off in that club and I got stuck in the toilet window? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best bleeding night I ever had. <laughs> I got fined a thousand quid, you know. I mean, there was nothing wrong with the show. Not in my opinion. I mean, obscenities as people see it, isn't it? Some people think one thing's right. And I wouldn't have cared, but the bleeding judge sat there with a wig on and a frock on. And they called me queer. That was what got my goat. I mean, let's be fair. <laughs> 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 it's legal anyway, thanks to the Socialist Party. <laughs> you look at some of the bleeding fellas, thank God it's not compulsory. That's what I say. You see, like, uh, if you go on the stage and say, a comic will say, I met a bird last night, a little belter. Now, when I walk on and say, I met a lovely fellow last night, they don't seem to see it in the wrong way. They see us as, as, as camp. It is funny. Without being homosexual. I, I can't explain it, but they are, if you walk funny, do a camp walk or uh, uh, do you like the suit, have had a check and all this, bit of that, they see it as a funny thing these days. And of course, it's accepted more now, you see, camp. Yes, on with the show anyway. And once again, we said we promise you every Wednesday the biggest stamp Stagger Armour show in Britain, which we do here every Wednesday night. Let's give a great big welcome on stage. Let's give a great big welcome on stage for the gorgeous Claudia. That's right away, Ram. Come on, let's go. Get it, get weaving. Get it, get it, go. What a performer. What a performer, that child. All the way from Africa to do this for 30 shillings using the crew. I'll never forget a night we did a club uh, at um, Burton Head and it was the first strip show they'd ever had at this place and this fella, <coughs> he said, uh, I've not booked any birds. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not going to tell him. So on he goes. <laughs> and I checked about his head, there's 700 fellas there all raving, you know. Uh, I've, uh, I've not booked any birds tonight, but within two minutes, <laughs> the bloody club went up. The organ come flying through the window, the drummer, I come flying through. <laughs> they wrecked the place, I'm not kidding. They completely wrecked it. That was the first stag night in Liverpool, and the last. <laughs> but now there was this fella called Samson, he was six foot two in his vest and his passion popped out like a painter's blow lamp. And he was knocking it off with this bird called Delilah, she was a ring spinner from a cop mill at Olum. And now this bird... <laughs> she used to sit on a ginnel wall, spitting promigranate seeds at the peasants, so they came past half pissed. He plighted his troth, and what a troth she had to plight in. <laughs> Well, his strength was so big that they had to do something about it, so she cut for the money off Leslie Lemp on the end, got him in a tent at Daisy Newcombe, Whit Friday, that's near Woodhouses, and he was blind as a bat in his... That was marvellous. You never opened your mouth, you threw your voice over there. <laughs> that was bleeding good, that. You see that, that man. Sergeant. <clears throat> So this fella called Samson, the Philistines, they're like A Division, Willard Street. They grab the poor bat, they, they grab him, they, and they cut all his hair off, they blind him as blind as a bat, and they tie him to a pole. Not a pole that came over here in 1954 and the Russians threw him out of the same with Czechoslovakia and 600,000 came over and took all your bleeding jobs and that's why your steel works are closing down. Not that sort of a pole. A big one piece of wood with all knobs on, they tie him to it and they shackle him with a pair of brass balls around his feet so he can't move. Just like I had at the Crown Court when I got knocked off and the bleeding judge sat there with a wig on the frock on, they call me queer. <laughs> Get it on. I like having a go. You have a go at me any time you like. Because <laughs> I'm not queer. They, oh, they all think I'm bleeding queer. I'm not. Well, you know me very well, don't you, son? My husband's queer, but I'm not. <laughs> Is she ready? Right, now, I'll give you a big announcement. I want you to give her a, a nice welcome, as you always do at the Glazebrook. Just sit there and talk. They won't accept comedy off a woman. Well, fellas won't, anyway, I don't know. It's nothing, is it? 
It's a thing that they'll never get women's lib about the comedy because they won't accept it. Especially a strong gag. If you're telling a strong gag, you know, uh, a sexy gag, anything like that, then they just won't accept it off a woman. Whether accept the situation of a fella, you know. I don't know many. Any, I don't know any women comedian, comedians. Very few. <laughs> Every Thursday, you drive me potty. Oh. <laughs> My them every, you know, they all get a glass of champagne apiece. Oh. Oh. such an army life. <laughs> and uh, everybody, everybody gets half a quid apiece, you see. Oh. <laughs> Somebody's touching Bush. me up at the back here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll turn it in. You'll have to marry me now, you'll have to marry me now, whoever that was. Who was that then? <laughs> I've lived around here all my life, you see. This is Harper Hay, the elite, the elite, uh, the elite part of, of the town. The elite anything around here. <laughs> and we have done. We've had poverty here. Yes, we've, we had, have. we've had hard times around here. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Yes, Charter Street Flag is good. You want to Charter Street Flag is good. Used to give me clogs there. Certainly, certainly. Their family, their family used to make clothes pegs for the gypsies. Who was that for? Isn't that right? <laughs> and her father was in the iron and steel business. Her father used to, her mother used to iron all day, and her father used to steal all night. Harvest <laughs> people, harvest people. <laughs> but it's what the kind of a district where everybody knows Flory. Are you listening? Yes, love. Yes. It's a kind of a district where everybody knows each other. You see, everybody knows each other's business. Is that right? Yes. yes. Business. Go on. Yes. Is that that's that business with you? No, it's no. not about when he when he started off in the shop. He used to go out with he used his to brother. Go out with it. That's right. And uh, yeah. then his dad was a bit tight with him. Brought them up the rough and the hard way. Right. So he didn't have enough money to go out, so he oh, had yeah. to sort no. a little bit out for himself, out yourself. yourself in himself. <laughs> 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 it's well, he had to go out, hadn't he? He had to go out with his dad in those no, days. Because they had no money. And no wages for the poor dad. We're better off today now than we've ever been. Yes, I'll say. Yes, we are. That's right. Well, I'll say. Yes, we are. 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 Yes, Playing the uh, record at about six in the morning. That's right, yes. And throwing spears up your lobby. Ah, uh, that's been a day, that was the day. <laughs> throwing spears up the lobby at half past four in the morning. Your house is worth about four bob, Flory. Oh, I'll give on that. Anyway. I'll give you four shilling. I was born in a little village near Barnsley. Lived there for most of my life. My mother was Yorkshire, my father, West Indian, come from Barbados. He came over here after World War One with four or five other West Indian lads, and they all seemed to settle in and around these little villages around Barnsley. Most of them worked in the pits. My uncle Cliff here is, is the only one left out of the five, and uh, he's 80 now, but he's worked all his life in the pits. No, I worked at, worked at Yorkshire, man. That's outside of Arlington. Now I came over here then in 1918 to, to Barnsley. In 1918. And I've been, and I've been at uh, Woolley Collie ever since until I retired in 1959. So that's. Oh, you had a long stint. You had a long oh, yes, stint, yeah. old loving pits. And if I had my time to come over again, I shouldn't go down. No, if I had my time to go, I shouldn't go down. I should tell them bring the call to me, you see. <laughs> but people were friendly. You know, well, it's, it's, you see, we're supposed to be all right for him because he were like he were born with, he were born a man. I mean, all the people like lads, he were born with them lads. So, so well, I mean, so they just come to them natural, ain't they? To be carrying on. But well, that's the main part is this: that there were no, no bother about colour. No, no, no. That no. was uh, nobody bothered. We we're only, all, all big pals together. It's only in these late years where they begin to get this, 
this kind of a mix up talk about colours. <laughs> but in them times, in them times everybody would have liked, you know. Well, I think they were more civilised than what they are now. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling them we're going to civilise them. <laughs> they come over and civilise well, us. Well, you, of course you. I never had no bother. Never had no, no bother like with uh, far as any colours concerned or like that. As I say, the people, the, uh, well, I suppose I knew the word that they're more Christian. You know, that's right, I knew, knew, put it that way. Yeah, but they they're see, more Christian. what's caused this, the influx of coloured people has been too much. I agree. There's been too much of it, and therefore, as I said, people have got a little bit afraid, and that's yeah. I think that's where. Uh, no, uh, uh, well, I might think do. so. But that's what's, my personal opinion. What same as Enoch, you know, he he think if we get too many, we might want to take take job off of him, you know, <laughs> and, and put him at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Does I know? I said to Enoch Powell, I said, knock it, come here, cock, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my the old knockers all right, I suppose. Depends. Does I know? Does I know? We made it magistrate for one day in bars. We made it magistrate just for one day. And third case on were a little packy. He were only a toddy, and he were only that big. So he said, uh, what they up for, old love? He said, riding a bike with no leads. <laughs> well, they talk like that now. <laughs> He says, 70 quid. He says, the what? <laughs> 70 quid for riding a bike with no leads? He said, yes. And it'd have been 200 if it had been dark. And then... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Oh, I always get on about him, you know. I see some Africans one day in Israel, Leeds, and you know. <laughs> Ooh, aren't they big, some of them Africans? Seven foot twelve, some of them. <laughs> Mother, it's no good in it dark, because I can't see them in dark. It's a, it's a laugh and blink the eyes, that's got them. <laughs> They're different from others Africans, and they've got thick lips. Have you seen the lips? Ooh. <laughs> Just like town and country tyres they are. <laughs> My idea of this, and, and it's, I've had this said to me by coloured people, that this is a good way of breaking down this, this racial prejudice. I've even had uh, vicars and, you know, men of the church and things, and they said, you're doing a good job. That is a good way. Uh, it, it, it does a lot for, uh, for coloured people, and it does help to break that barrier. So I think, personally, I think I, I'm doing a good job, let's put it that way. And I enjoy doing it. I enjoy a good laugh. When I see people laughing, happy and then we're all happy, one happy family. And that's what it's all about, having a good life and, and don't know, it's being right with folk. Our old lady also said there's no wrong with right folk. And that's how it should be, innit? And we Yorkshire, well I am, I don't know if I can't vouch for that. Look, when I was in the studio, I said, he said, hey, come here, I want the child I said, what's up, old love? He said, are they really Yorkshire? <laughs> I said, ah, but keep it dark. And, <laughs> Am I Yorkshire? Eh, that can't buy class, can I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is my game, this. Played 12 years with Doncaster. The 1950s right up to 1960. Played centre half and wing half. I really enjoyed the game. Really enjoyed the game. Charlie! Hey. I'm on in a bit, you're all right. They've not done it for any carpet slippers. They're not, they haven't got no right boots on like we used to wear. There's no pads. I, I, overall, I think, I don't think there's any on here be faster than when I were playing. Personally, me, I'm speaking about me. I don't think there's many of these will be a 10.1 man. Oh, you're in trouble. Oh, I like that. It's 
says, right, flower, every minute now, and I'll get waiter. And he looked round and said, say, oh, waiter, come here, old love, let's have this. Come on, come, come on, up, up. Well, they don't understand that in France, you know. <laughs> Very backward. <laughs> said, hey, oh, froggy, come here, lad, come on, up, come on, come. Hey, come on. He knew then he wanted him, you know. <laughs> He said, now then, old love, would I uh, bring our lass a pint of Barnsley? <laughs> he said, and I'll have a pint of Tetley's. He said, but monsieur, you must... He said, hey, oh, hold on. Bless her lip, on the roller. <laughs> he said, but monsieur, you must start... He said, I shall go thee. He said, but monsieur, you... He said, I shall stick clogging, old lad. <laughs> he said, monsieur, you have insulted me. I challenge you to a duel. He said, fair enough, get the coit off. <laughs> Where's that water? It's inside or out. He said, six o'clock in the morning. Well, what does six o'clock mean to a collier that up at forward? <laughs> he said, fair enough, I'll see the old love. Six o'clock next morning, collier stood there. Clogs on. <laughs> Sharpening irons on Corsi. <laughs> hey, Frenchman come up with brought this second with him. Brought second, two swords. Gid one to Collier, because he thought it were a toothpick, then not. <laughs> he said, Monsieur, you have made the greatest mistake of your life. You have challenged the finest swordsman in France. He said, you will not die quickly. He said, carry on. <laughs> he said, Monsieur, I am going to cut off your ears. Then I will cut off the tip of your nose. Then I will cut off your arms. And lastly, I will cut off your legs below the knees. <laughs> Collier says, piss off. <laughs> Tell me that one. <laughs> a black Yorkshireman, that's a joke for a start, isn't it? You know, and they haven't got the Pakistanis, and I'm sorry for the Pakistanis, because they've, you know, they, they've taken over from the Jewish gags and the Irish gags. Now everybody's giving the Pakistanis an hammering. You know. So it's, uh, it's hard luck on them for the next 20 years. I tell you what would be a, a breakthrough. A Pakistani comedian. Now, if a Pakistani could make people laugh, you know, He'd be a millionaire in a month because everybody wanted to book him. See? You know, with all the Pakistani jokes, if a Pakistani could get up. I don't know of any Pakistan comedian. There's Negro comedians, as you know. I've been brought up as a white man. In all intents and purposes, I'm a black man. I walk down the street, people look at me and they say, well, there goes a the darkie. They don't know I was born in, in Lancashire or Manchester. And going back as far as just before the war, I can remember going to Wigan and children used to follow me about in little packs because they'd never seen a colour, never seen a colour kid before. Never seen a colour kid before. And I can remember people, in actual instances, two people coming and knocking on my mother's door and asking if they could keep me. I mean, I can remember cracking gaggles from the age of seven. And um, possibly in them days it was defence. But now I'm not defending, I'm attacking. I should imagine that some people get a bit huffy. I mean, after all said and done, this is England. Made for the English. But you must also remember that Africa was made for the African. But things don't work out that way, do they? I've never had a colour friend. I've had a few coloured acquaintances, but I've never had a colour friend. Not because I've not desired a colour friend, but it's just that uh, I've been brought up amongst white people and uh, my attachments have been to the white people. But uh, I have a lot of coloured acquaintances. I mean, I'm not prejudiced, you know, because even my friends are coloured. <laughs>
I've never played Brick House. I think it's one of the only clubs I've never played in, 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 in Yorkshire. But um, apparently it's a, it's a very, very nice club. It's owned by a gentleman who believes in, in cabaret and giving his customers the best value of entertainment. This is the way we propose to do it. We introduce you to your Jackie will bring each one of you on stage to do about a 20 or a 25 minute spot. Is that okay? Yeah, it's all right, but the format we had last time was uh, all the comics go on first and you all do your patter. Um, and uh, then when I come on, nobody sung anything and nobody plays any banjo, so I come on at the end and then I do a bit of singing, you see. But, but Sammy, uh, yeah, Sammy I know, plays a thing. Yeah, I know he does, hey, but hey, listen, uh, listen, I, don't, uh, listen, listen, listen. I don't think we should do that. I think we should stick to the same format, you know. What was you going to sing, Sammy? What was you going to sing? Uh, Lean lamp post. Lean on lamp post. Yes. And um, like you tell your door. Like you tell your door. And um, lean, uh, when I'm cleaning windows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other former number that he does. I'm leaning on the lamp post at the corner of the street in case a certain little lady comes by. Oh me. Beautiful and anyone can understand why I'm leaning on the lamp post at the corner of the screen in case it's here to little lady facet Lordy Lordy a certain little lady Jack walking along the street. Little kid was walking at the side of him. Little kid looked up at a darky. Said, hey there, mister. What are you wearing sunglasses for in this weather? The dark chap said, what do you mean sunglasses? Those aren't sunglasses. Those are my nostrils. <laughs> well, if you don't laugh at me next, gag, I'm going to come and live next door to you. <laughs> Because I remember you were a small girl, and your mother and father, tell about that dark chap. We're going to come and carry her away. Have a ride. <laughs> uh, are you all right, sir? Oh, no, never mind, never mind. You all right, love? Enjoying the drink? Good. I must say, you're looking very chic tonight. I said, chic. <laughs> Blonde hair, blue eyes, pink cheeks, red lips, and they call me coloured. Well, I'm, I am telling you the truth now. Now, what's, what's the score with him? What, what, what's happening? It's six shows. There's five at the Ritz Brig House and one at the Candlelight. No. OK. Right on. I've won them all there at the candlelight for about, what, nine, nine o'clock, maybe 9.30 at the latest. And we'll have no more problems this week. No, but we'll have no more problems this week. OK. right oh, thank you. right oh, Bye-bye. We brought the show over from Brighouse to Oldham here, the comedian show. When we got here, we found out that the top of the bill couldn't appear. He had the flu, so we're told. Um, it was a bit embarrassing, really. The place was full. We turned over 200 people away. And uh, we'd 400 people in. But, of course, we couldn't tell them, you see. It would have spoiled the whole effect. We didn't really know what to do. The manager, Charlie, was 
running about wondering what to do. The compo was doing his nut. But so we, we rang up, uh, we know several of them, and several of them are local guys around here, and we did ring up uh, one in particular, Manning, the guy called Bernard Manning, who was one of the comedians. We rang him up, but unfortunately, he was unable to get up here. He would have done if he could, but he, he couldn't get up here. But I couldn't do it, you know, I'm so busy here. So, I telephoned him, tell him, I told him I couldn't do it anyway. There was a bit of trouble up there. Because the top of the bill, they'd all paid good money to get in, you see. They'd come to see the top, the great top of the bill. All paid loads of cash to get in. And they're all sat there, banging the feet, stamping the pint pots, you know. Because that's how they are up north, you know. You can't kid them up here, you know. I'm telling you, you put a top of the bill and the top of the bill's got to turn up or you've got to give them the money back. And who wants to give anybody the money back? Not me. I thought, well, I've done everything I can do about it, so I've got to, you know, I've got to just get out of here now, so I just got out <laughs> and left it to Charlie. Left it to me, yeah. Thank you very well, much. he's the manager, God, I mean, <laughs> from there, I don't know what happened, because I left. It was, it was a terrible atmosphere. Everybody started banging on the tables, banging the glasses, banging the feet. I thought for a few minutes that we were going to have an uproar in the club. I wouldn't like it to happen again at all, you know, it's, it's impossible to try and control everybody, you know. We, we had one or two, I finished up with an elderly lady completely accusing me that we'd never boot this certain comedian and clouting me about the year old with the handbag. Well, as you know, uh, there's an awful lot of people uh, in, in Liverpool that come from Ireland, Liverpool Irish, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they, they put them down as thick. It's supposed to be thick, so that's what uh, George Roper and most of these comedians work on, you know. The best, the best Irish joke I like is about the, the one about the fellow who escaped from Walton. And he believes he's in Ireland, see, so the English CID sent some mug photographs over. The front view, the right view, and the left view. And the Irish CID wrote back, we caught the middle one, we're still looking for the other two. <laughs> he's a scouser, he's from Liverpool. Well, it's a very funny city. You, you've got to be funny to live in Liverpool, haven't you? Have you seen Liverpool? They're pulling it down and putting slums up. But he's from Liverpool, George, and uh, very nice comic, George. There's a lot of Irish gear, you know, and uh, about the wellies, the Irishmen on the building sites and all that. Ooh, how do you like me at them? <laughs> this is it. Back on the old building site with the wellies. Not an advert, this. It's definitely me. This is where I started, all, all, on the building sites. Bloody freezing today, all right, isn't it? Look at all the lads over here, all the foremen. Never been so well dressed in my life, by the way. Hey, this is where the gag started about the uh, Irish fella came across to Whitby for a job. The foreman said, are you looking for a job, Pat? He says, I am. He said, can you work with a wheelbarrow? He said, I don't know nothing about machinery. <laughs> but all right. Now, you think they're putting a the house up here? It's not. This is the hut. Aer <laughs> <laughs> Lingus went jet last week, Aer Lingus. So if you want to go home to Dublin, you can go on after time. The first plane took off from Ringway, flying at an altitude of 13,000 feet. <laughs> to a 600 mile an hour. All of a sudden, one of the engines scalloped. <laughs> and the captain came out the cabin, an ex Wimpy crane driver in his wellies and a parachute. <laughs> He said, don't panic, I'm going for help. <laughs> There's a lot of Scotch in Liverpool as well. Netherfield Road is just about uh, a mile away from here. There's the Orange Lodge, the Royal Orange Lodge, and Scotty Road's the Catholic area. But they're great here. There's no bombs, no bullets or nothing. My uncle's got a good job now. He's in the IRA. He's a rear gunner on a milk float. <laughs> you don't want me acting them, do you? You see what they're doing in Northern Ireland with all the Pakistanis, melting them down and making rubber bullets out of them. <laughs> <laughs> she lovely. Got some good clientele in this club, Bernard. Bernard, got some good clientele in the club. Very nice people, always are here, George. Do Common, well. but wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> you get underfelt with that suit. Hey? You get underfelt with that suit. Did you get underfelt with this suit? <laughs> I got it from the same table you did, you know, that same tailor, wasn't it? That Jewish fella. Camel Leds. Camel Leds. <laughs> Saw a young couple making passionate love in the back of a car. Do you know, I think that's disgusting, that, don't you? In the back of a car. Yeah. I can't get in the back of a car. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get the furniture, man, never mind. 
this fellow was making passionate love, and the police were shouting, hey! And the fellow jumped with really frightened, wasn't he? And he stood there with his belt at the bottom of his welly. <laughs> See, his kecks were, and <laughs> she's looking at me like <laughs> And the copper said, hey, what are you doing? He said, fair cop, he said, I'm making love to my girlfriend in the back of me jam jam. <coughs> Policeman said, I'll tell you what, if I'm next, we'll forget all about it. <laughs> Jesus, <it's wild. laughs> The bloke says, you're on. He's getting out the car and he's shaking. The copper said, what are you shaking for? He could have never made love to a policeman before. <laughs> All clean, Bernard. All clean, John. This smoking lark's no good, is it? Every time I light a cigarette up now, I feel like one of those little lemmings going over a cliff. <laughs> and where the hell do you get bloody cigarettes from, them lemmings? I don't know you. <laughs> Actually, I've cut it down now. I have a smoke after each meal. And I've cut my meals down to 40 a day. <laughs> Can you imagine the queer? Have we got any queers here? Apart from Bernie Manning. Look at him bowing down and shut him out, you know, I'll smash him in bloody arm back. What's your bottom price? <laughs> What's your bottom price? Come on, Emily. I don't mind know why I work on this bloody club at all. See, so you've got tablecloths here. It's the only club of tablecloths, this. I thought you were going to pay me there for a minute. I thought Bernie's getting my wages over. Have you been into the dressing rooms here? You need a penny to get in. <laughs> he even got his bloody mother working behind the poor bar. <laughs> Look at the sweat and he's got his man there. Hi there. Can't trust anybody else in that bloody till, can you? Chuck her out. <laughs> Hi, Irishman says to his mate, lend us five pounds. He says, I've only got four. He says, you can owe me one. <laughs> Don't keep walking about so fast, Stanley, like that. You're going to burn the floor up, lad. All right. I'm being focused. It's time to focus from there. Burn it. <laughs> What was he in the army, George? I believe he was in the army one year as a roadblock. <laughs> Pardon? George Roper doesn't have a bath, you know, goes through the car wash. <laughs> Follows me in. <laughs> oh, God. I bet you flattened a bit of grass in your time and all, haven't you? Eh? I used to be fat like you. And George, get it off, son. I thought you were looking at me over a pile of crumpets then. I'm not kidding you. Get it off, George. It's terrible, that fuck. Nice suit, too. I'm sure that style will come back, George. Don't keep moving about it. The style will come back. Would you mind standing over there so your head's shining in my eyes? Keep it up, Bernard. Thank you very much. Cover your knees up, love. I'm trying to compare the show here. It's very hard. Though. Two thousand years ago, do you want to hear how they got, we got the commandments? Two thousand years ago, the Lord was looking down on the earth. He said to the Romans, do you want some commandment? They said, what are they? They said, thou shalt not commit adultery and love thy neighbour. He said, no. He said, we don't want nothing like that down here. <laughs> and he looked down on the desert there, and this little Yiddish fellow's coming through the desert there, with his little Yamuki on and his beard and his eyes watering, singing through the desert. If I were a rich man, <laughs> and the Lord says, Hey, hey! He says, Yes, what is it? He said, You want some commandments? He says, How much are they? He says, Nothing. He says, Give us ten. 
you, you gormless get, isn't it? I'm filming now, you've got to be quiet till the end of the gag, then laugh. All right. I'm serious now, otherwise you go through the bleeding door. <laughs> right, I don't want you to have early night tonight. Take it easy. Are you off, George? Nice big round of applause for George Robe, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much, George. Pick was a centre man for him. Shut up, you fine bastard. Get out of you don't swear in here, it's our bleeding club, not yours, you know. My father died a couple of years ago and he left me well, well fixed, you know. I'm not sure of a few, Bob. That's one good thing, you know. Never have holiday. Never have holiday. And sit just as much beer as I want here. Good show. Wonderful show every night. And, uh, I mean, there's nothing the seaside can offer me. I, I mean, I'd get bored, stiff, sat in a deck chair with a packet of crisps, you know. And I, <laughs> it would just drive me potty. I'd be wondering how the club's doing and, uh, you know, how the till's going on. Because my mum works on the till, you know, she's uh, 71, which is marvellous 71, you know, but she works on the till. Anybody that handles money in this business, you know, is a relation. That's it. So if you're getting robbed, you're getting robbed by your own, you know, aren't you? Make sure everybody signs the book and shows the membership cards. Uh, we've got a, a comic on tonight, a marvellous comic tonight, uh, but a bit way out, you know, a bit of a weirdy. Uh, John, his name is, John. And uh, he's had a hit record. He's had a hit record, The Man from Nazareth. But whether they'll accept his comedy or not, I don't know. He's, he's a bit way out. He tells a few, you know, <laughs> talks about wars and IRA and all this nonsense. I don't know any of the traditional musical type comedians who would employ topics of this nature. You know, they prefer to sit back on the 30, 40, 50 jokes they already have in their head, the same as music hall comedians did years ago. They close theatres, they're employing the same methods now, and they'll damn well close clubs. Unless someone more aware gets onto the stage, because audiences are more aware now. The Max Miller audience is still there, but they're petering out slowly and their children are taking their place. You know, the people who like the Rolling Stones, they don't listen to Stefan Grappelli, however good he might be. I don't know if they accept him here. He probably will. he would probably accept him. You know, these young fellas, I think they accept him. The middle-aged people and the and young people won't do. Anyway, I'll go and put the axe on now. Make sure everything's OK up here. I'll go start the show. Many people say, oh, you're ahead of your time. Rubbish. I'm here. This is my time. They are reflecting Max Miller's humour. I know there's an audience for it, but there's also an audience for my type of humour. And I hope you're going to like his kind of comedy, because I think in about 6,000 years, it'll catch on. You know. Are you ready? Yeah. Lovely voice, lovely voice. Now, anybody of a nervous disposition, leave the room immediately, because we're not insured for this. Peace on earth and goodwill to all fairies and hobgoblins who wear surgical boots. Hey, you, sir, look as though you get the same complaints as I get. <laughs> you are accused very often of being a long-haired git. The same as I. We are accused, aren't we, sir? You and I have been members of the hippie party. Right or wrong? And we are not, are we? Although I do go to their parties. <laughs> yeah? Like you, madam. You believe in free love? No? You like to pay? <laughs> Sweet lady. Are you married? Don't sit there looking like... What do you mean, don't answer Benny? Who the hell are you, his manager? It's not Benny, it's Derek. Derek, yeah. your elocution is disgusting. <laughs> if I get my hair cut, sir, if I get my hair cut, I'll be accused of a skinhead and I'll have to kick you because you look very much like a Pakistani. <laughs> what a way to go. As I told you earlier, sir, 
As I told you earlier, sir, there's a lot of humor in death. I look forward to going. In fact, I've just written a new book. It's called Sex After Death, or How to Get Laid in the Grave. <laughs> Would you believe, sir, that many people, in fact, only three nights ago, someone came to me and complained because I had dared to use such an obscene three-letter word as tit. <laughs> they said, you will be banished forever. I said, come now, there are far more worse pornographic words in the world than titty. Would you agree with me, sir? Yes. Then stand up and tell them you agree with me. Up and tell them. There are far worse words than titty. Most people think the worst four-letter word in the world is to do with copulation. It's not, sir. Copulation is a beautiful thing, ain't it? Right. The worst four-letter word in the world, ma'am, for me, is the word bomb. A dirty, filthy, nasty, obscene thing. Would you agree? Yes! Now, which would you rather hold in your hands, sir? A live bomb or a live tit, eh? <laughs> ah! It's a simple logic. <laughs> I remember well, ma'am, being in the womb. It was all dark and warm in there. Comforting. Wasn't much womb inside? You are used to dealing with comedians, aren't you? Be careful with a beard like that. If you walk out of here, you may get shot. Or didn't you hear of Abraham Lincoln? Tell me, sir, why do you wear a beard? Do you think you are more sexually attractive to the opposite sex? Why is it? It tickles your fancy. Their fancy. What position of sexual activity is that? <laughs> On the wardrobe. I see, you like high action. <laughs> One leg in the bed. One leg where, sir? <laughs> in the bed. <laughs> Why do you always have to associate bed with sexual activity? Oh, this is it. This is what? This is it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Well, you've got to, haven't you? <laughs> you've got to what, sir? <laughs> I'd rather not say. <laughs> why? You'd like to do it, so why not say it? <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> come, come now. <laughs> now, come on, let's go back to be no humour. What lies in the grass and goes ding-dong, a wounded Avon lady. What a load of rubbish. Comedians of the old-fashioned type, the traditional type, they want to stand up there, rabbit off jokes, the joke machine man, without using the brains at all, without even looking at a newspaper a week old and digging a joke out of it. You see, someone has got to provide the new jokes. The ordinary working man in the street provides a new job. There's a new situation at work every day. Like the dockers going on strike, the car workers going on strike, the docker kicking a toy toys to death, and the fellow ah, thinking, why do you do it? He said, it's great. following me around at work all day. There's not one bit of originality in any one of them. This is what I'm asking for. Let them be themselves, not carbon copies of each other. And they all go around saying they stole each other's jokes. Well, they all steal mine and all that. <laughs> <laughs> they all steal my guts, but uh, what can you do about it? You got, you're there to make people laugh, and that's what you do. You stand yeah. up, and you make people roar, you make people laugh. So that's all, that's all comedy's about. My husband and I have decided, after very careful consideration, that it's Butlins again for us this year. No, it's wrong, because... No, no, let's, let, let's face it, no, we're, we're brilliant now, yeah, we were brilliant. I mean, you can always spot a Liverpool fellow a mile away, can't you? I didn't know this was a country club. <laughs> You've heard that gag, have you? <laughs> Looking at his face, may the Lord drop a clog on you. <laughs> might get right near it, Bowen. We might touch it, but we'll have a right in the <laughs> The Irish fellow went to the Labour Exchange there and he said to the fellow behind him, have you got any work? The fellow said, not a thing, not a bloody thing. I knew that an Irishman could have a shamrock in his turban. I think they call him a leprechaun. Oh, God, come for me now, whether in the wrong establishment. What are you laughing at? <laughs>